O come. O come, all you unfaithful, come, weak and unstable, come, know you are not alone. O come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come, see what your God has. is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. O come, O come, bitter and broken, come. Can fears unspoken come, taste of his perfect love. Oh, come, guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. He's the Lamb. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our part. His promise is peace for those who believe. He's the land that was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. So come, though you have not. What your God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. How I love. of Jesus on the cross of Calvary he declares his work is finished he has spoken this hope to me though the sun has ceased the shining though the war appeared as lost Christ has triumphed over evil it was finished upon that cross. Now the curse. Now the curse, it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. For the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome that I receive. Oh, the I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more kill to carry. It was finished upon that cross. Death 
was once. Death was once my great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me. But the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Death. Death was once my great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Yes, He rose that we would be free indeed. Free from every plan of darkness, free to laugh and free to love. Death is dead and Christ is risen. It was finished upon the cross. Onward to eternal glory. To my Savior and my God, I rejoice at Jesus' victory. It was finished upon the cross. It was finished upon the cross. It was finished upon the cross. In Jesus, Lord of heaven. Jesus, Lord of heaven. I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you've made. With mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely paid. Your love is deeper than any ocean's higher, than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you've made with mercy beyond measure my debt you freely paid your love is deeper than any ocean's higher and the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. And your love is deeper than any ocean's higher. Than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds.
This morning we gather to share what is called communion or the Lord's Supper. We like to invite every baptized believer who trusts in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins to participate with us. If this is you, I ask that you either come to my left or right to take the bread and cup, hold on to them as we will take them together. If today, if you are not baptized and a follower of Jesus, we want to encourage you to first consider the ordinance of baptism. That you can talk to me or Pastor Theo or any of our deacons about um, how to get baptized and why a believer should get baptized. If you are not a follower of Jesus, we welcome you. We're very glad you are here this morning. But today is not the day for you to take the bread and cup. But it can be the day that you take hold of Christ and believe. And if you have any questions about what it means to follow Christ, we want to welcome you to talk to me, Pastor Theo, or any of our deacons again who are passing out the elements today. During this time, as you wait in line or wait for others to receive the bread and cup, it could be a time to consider the songs we have sung, maybe the prayers you have prayed, and just how the Lord is calling you to respond today. I'd like to invite those to line up now to receive the bread and cup.
As we partake of the bread and the cup, we receive Christ and all of his benefits. We have our faith nourished, and we get a foretaste of the heavenly feast that awaits us. The bread and cup is also a symbol and representation of the gruesome death of Jesus Christ, nailed to the cross for the sins of many. We, re we receive this sacrament as a sign and seal of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 24 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In verse 25 and 26, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Heavenly Father, we are so joyful and thankful as we're reminded of this great gift you have given us, sending your Son to come, to live, die, rise again, so people like us can be brought right into your kingdom, forgiven and reconciled, adopted, called sons and daughters. We're so grateful, Lord. And we are reminded again this morning of the painful sacrifice, what it took to accomplish our salvation. Lord, may we never take it for granted. May it never become stale. May it never become something banal or boring. But may it fill our hearts over and over again, each and every day. We pray this your son's name. Amen. The catechism is a question and answer method of discipleship which gives the believer an opportunity to learn valuable truths of the faith so that their hearts may be transformed, so they may grow in Christ's likeness. I'll read a question from the New City Catechism, and then I'd like to invite you to respond with me as we recite the answer together. Verse 29, Beloved, how can we be saved? Only by faith in Jesus Christ and in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God and are still inclined to all evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe in him. There is nothing we have done or can ever do that will give us the ability to save ourselves. By faith alone, we rely on Christ and what he has done on our behalf to be our hope and salvation. It is pure grace for God to impute or credit Christ's righteousness towards us when we repent and believe in him. At this time, I'd like to dismiss our children between the ages of four and nine years of age. And then for the rest of us, I invite you to stand and hear the word of the Lord. We will be in Ephesians chapter two, verses 13 through 17 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. One of the themes of each Christmas season that you'll see is peace on earth. Perhaps it's written on a banner 
Or maybe there's like a little dove with a picture of a globe on it. We sing about it. We talk about it. We hope for it. We might even think to ourselves, man, I hope I find some peace of mind in this lifetime. I hope I find some paradise. Peace is something we all strive for, something we all want, yet it seems to be an unreachable goal. We have these conflicts we see in our timeline, right? Whether it's the Ukraine or Russian conflict, the Palestinian or Israeli conflict, or maybe it hits a little bit closer to home. Maybe it's conflict with parents or with friends or with roommates. We have conflict maybe in our marriage or our workplace. We all want some sort of peace. And there is sometimes an indication that we don't have it. And as we continue our Advent series, we are reminding ourselves of what arrived when Christ came, and with the arrival of Christ himself. Advent means arrival, and during the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we are reminding ourselves that with the arrival or Advent of Christ also came the arrival of hope, peace, joy, and love. This morning is the second Sunday of Advent, and that is our topic of today, which is the Advent or arrival of peace. We're in the book of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing to that church, reminding them of their reconciliation to God, but also their reconciliation to others as well. With Christ came peace between them and God, and a restoration between them and those who are culturally and ethnically different than them. And this morning, the main passage of this, the main idea of this passage is this. Christ's arrival gave us peace with God and his people. Christ's arrival gave us peace with God and his people. And our first point is this, that Christ's incarnation achieved a peace between us and God. God. We'll start in verses 13 through 15 this morning. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. Peace. I do want to go a little bit backwards, um, even though we're starting in verse 13. But as you see in verse 13, it starts in the middle of an idea. It says, but now in Christ. Well, what, is he, what was he saying before? In the beginning of chapter 2, Paul actually starts by laying out who they once were. Verses 1, he said he was, they were dead in their trespasses and sins in which they once walked. Verses three, verse 3, once, they once lived in the passions of our flesh, flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, by nature children of wrath. That's who they once were. Then Paul lays out what God has done. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the, his great love, which he loved us. In verse 5 and 6, he made us alive together with Christ, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then after he lays out who they once were and what God has done, then he, wants to, then he moves to the point of what does this mean for them, for the Ephesians, and even for us, what does it mean for us? Right? Verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. Verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. And then in verse 11 and 12, he reminds the Ephesians of their past that they were Gentiles. They were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and they were strangers to the covenant promise, having no hope without God in the world. See, unlike the Jewish people, they knew who knew of the promised Messiah, they grew up waiting and anticipating a Messiah, or a rival of a person that was coming to save them. The Gentiles knew nothing of that. That was not part of kind of their culture, nor part of what they've learned. They only had the physical material world in front of them. And in their minds, for a lot of them, 
the physical and the material, what was in front of them, that was their only reality. And when that passed away with their passing, that was it. There was nothing beyond that. They knew nothing of God. They knew nothing of the promises of God or the hope that was supposed to come to the nations. Individually, they were separated from God, verses 1 through 10. And even corporately as Gentiles, they are separated as well um, in the eyes of the Jewish people in verses 11 through 12. So nationally and individually, they were a people without hope. But as you remember from last week, in Christ, hope arrived. And we saw that hope in verses 1 through 10. And how because of God's rich, being rich in mercy and because of his great love, Made, him alive, made them alive together with Christ, being the advent or arrival of hope for them. And in this passage, we are introduced with what hope has brought about, which is now the arrival or advent of peace. Through Christ's incarnation, achieved a peace between us and God. Verse 13 begins with reminding of who they are now. It says, but now in Christ. So those are all the things you once were, but now in Christ. Paul describes them as being in Christ because of God's rich mercy and his great love, how he made them alive in Christ. He's also saving them in Christ. He describes their past. They were once someone, they were a group that were far off. They were once far off. Now they're brought near to God by the blood of Christ. The Gentiles were far off from God in all aspects, especially their sins. And really, the sins of every single person had left a large chasm between the sinner and their creator. What bridged this chasm was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is what it meant when he said, when Paul said that they've been brought near by the blood of Christ, that the coming of Christ came to rectify the sins of man. It is important to note that the coming of Christ was not just the divine that came down, but the Son of God took on flesh and came down as human. So he can identify with the plight of man, with our struggles, our limitations, our temptations, and our weaknesses. He knows what it means to be human. And with that, he knows what it means to feel pain or hurt. And the divine came down so he could be wounded, so he can be sacrificed, so he can bleed. And the blood of Christ is the representation of the sacrifice Christ gave for the sins of man. It points to Jesus' true humanity. This is Christ's incarnation, which is a term which is, re- which is a term that refers to the idea of God taking on flesh. That it was necessary for the sacrifice in order to be effective for us, for Jesus to be truly human and truly God. And that is what brought peace with God. And so those who are now once far off, they have now been able to be brought near. The sacrifice of Jesus is bodily life, death, and resurrection. The advent of Christmas that we celebrate is the celebration and reminder that Christ came as man, yet still truly divine. This is so important to our salvation. This is why we celebrate Christmas, because Christ was born. Friends, I want to let you know that with the arrival of Christ, we celebrate this Christmas This can be your celebration today. If you place your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and his perfect life lived on your behalf, his sacrificial death in your place, his resurrection from the dead, proving his power and victory over his sin and death, if you place your hope and trust in Jesus, you will be saved. When we turn from our sins that bring us at odd with God and take hold of Christ, we are forgiven. And he brings the peace we have with God, a peace we can never achieve on our own. And in verse 14, he says he himself is our peace. That he doesn't just bring us peace, but he is the object of our peace. He is our peace. And as our peace, he's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility 
Scripture calls Christ our Prince of Peace. It is important that we understand that peace is not just talking about a lack of conflict. It's not just talking about tranquility or stillness, peace of mind or quiet. Biblical peace is our relational reconciliation between us and God. We, who were once enemies of God, in rebellion against God, you can even say that we were at war with God, that is no longer the case. That is what it means when we are at peace or inherited and been given peace. See, the good news is not that we've been subdued and conquered enemies, but adopted sons and daughters of God. He took us rebels and elevated us in his kingdom and family. This is the peace we have inherited and received through Christ. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, in the very beginning of this book, says that they obtained an inheritance. Verse 11, and so much more. If you just read from verse 1 through verse 14, that very first chapter of Ephesians, Paul actually lays out what they have and who they are. They, are, they have inherited this great spiritual blessing. This is peace. It isn't only that we're no longer in conflict, but we have been embraced into the kingdom and regarded as one of his own. And that's what it means in verse 14. It says the hostility he broke was the hostility between us and God, the rebel who was redeemed. And in verse 15, Christ's life, death, and resurrection became the total fulfillment of the laws and prophets, doing the very thing we could not do on our own. And with that said, we are to continue to live by faith in obedience, not because we're trying to fulfill the law for our salvation, but as new people in Christ, we're living out our new identity that we have in him. We're not trying to be who we ought to be by our own strength, but living out who we truly are as new creations in Christ. Beloved, this morning, do you know that in Christ you have peace, a peace that was never earned and a peace that can never be taken away. That no matter how bad it gets here, your relationship with God is reconciled and you have right standing. I get it. Like it oftentimes it does feel hard. That it, does, it feels hard like we don't feel like we have peace. It is easy to feel overwhelmed by life circumstances. And, and sometimes your life circumstance is hard. Like, no one's going to look at it and go, no, 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 like, you're just taking it you're too far, or like, no, that's no big deal. Like, there are realities that life is hard. And it feels like there's no peace. And it feels like there's only turmoil. And oftentimes, we no, maybe cognitively in our mind, or you hear this, like, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus is our peace. But it sure doesn't seem to reflect reality. Maybe it goes beyond ourselves, and sometimes we think of different ways. Like, man, if we had the right president in office, it's like, oh, then, then we will have peace. Or if we only had these policies or laws that were put in place, then, then that is where peace will come. Or maybe it's just like, if I only got a job, that's when I'll be at peace. Because maybe you, you were laid off, or maybe you just are trying to find a job because you're about to graduate, and you're just like, it's so hard. If I only got a job, then that's where peace will come. Or if I can only get that house or move into that neighborhood, if I can only get into those, that school, if I can only get those grades, that, that is where peace is. Right? If I can achieve these goals, that is where peace is. And it feels like we're constantly chasing. You're constantly running in hopes that you can get to a place that you can finally be at rest, that you can finally be at peace. Peace is something that you, see, you feel like I am running towards, something I'm looking for, something that I have to find. But beloved, we need to be reminded and we have already have, we already have the greatest peace in Christ. 
Christ doesn't just come to offer peace. Christ is the very object of our peace. And if you have Christ, and if you are in Christ, you have peace. For us, no matter how difficult things get here, and we don't want to minimize that, but we want to be reminded that Christ reigns over our turmoil, that there is true peace. Because the one thing that we should be most concerned about is the one thing he took care for us. That our relationship with God went from turmoil to reconciled. Let that be the barometer of peace in your life today. Trust in that, that if you have Christ, you do have peace. And let that peace reign over your life. Let that peace determine everything else. And, if, and we are reminded that Christ came to understand the plight of man. He understands and knows your struggles, your pains, your difficulty. He is not unaware of that. That is the reason why he came, to give peace in the midst of that turmoil. Let that be the barometer of peace in your life today. And this peace is not only individual or personal, which it is, it is. But there's actually a corporate and communal nature to Christ's peace as well, which leads to our second point. Our peace with God affects our relationships with other believers. Look at verse, we'll, we'll start from verse 14. It says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commands expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were once, who were far off, and peace to those who were near. You see, in this passage, especially illustrated earlier in verses 11 through 12, it speaks of two very different people. There are those who are the Jewish people of Jewish descent and those who are non-Jewish, known as the Gentiles. And the difference was vast. There's a difference in ethnicity, in culture, and even their, maybe their previous religions, so to speak. They came from a very different worldview. They saw, even the way they saw each other were very different. For example, the Jewish people saw themselves as God's chosen people, and they lived that out accordingly. The Gentiles, they saw them as the other, the outsider, people that didn't belong. As an example, one commentator described the temple situation in this way, that when, uh, that when a Gentile would come to the temple to worship, there's actually a wall that would restrict non-Jews into the court of the Gentile uh, to the court of Gentiles in the temple area. And on that wall, there's a big, there was a no trespassing sign. And on that wall, with that sign, it says this, let no one of any other nation, Gentiles, come within the fence and barrier around the holy place. Whoever is caught doing so will himself be responsible for the fact that his death will ensue. They were seen as ceremonial unclean. In the book of Acts, we would see this kind of play out, how the two kind of melded together slowly, but they did. Surely, but slowly, that dividing wall of hostility was being torn down. But it wasn't always easy. The Jewish believers, they would feel a little bit uneasy around Gentile believers because they were taught their whole lives that they were not to associate with the Gentiles. They were to see them as unclean. And the Gentiles, they also saw the Jewish people as very odd in their rituals and ceremonial ways. The Gentiles called the Jewish people pagans. They thought what they were doing were really odd and very different from the rest of culture. They're like, man, those Jewish people, they are so different culturally from us. And so with that, 
you have these two very different groups. And especially if you have one group looking at the other one as unclean and that they don't belong, it's going to uh, cause quite a bit of animosity between these two groups. So in verse 14, when Paul talks about how Jesus is our peace and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, that also, now that of course applies to us, between, our, between us and God and that dividing wall of hostility that he reconciled, but at the same time, he was speaking about the hostility of the Jewish people and the Gentile people. And the arrival of peace in Christ brought peace between us and God and between us and God's people, regardless of past, background, ethnicity, culture, or even social economic status. Verse 15 and 16 speaks of uniting two different groups of people and in Christ becoming a new man, making peace, reconciling both groups to God. And as they are brought in Christ, they're brought towards one another, filling the hostility they had for each other. This is through Christ that we can have true reconciliation, true peace, true diversity, and true unity. So as Christ draws people to himself, it, it inevitably draws people closer to each other, people that you would never think should belong together. The church is and will and should continue to be a picture of that peace between people that might have little to nothing to do with each other. This is what the gospel has achieved for us. Our world actually craves this, and they try to achieve it by its own means, but for us in Christ, this is our reality. And in verse 17, we see that this is why Christ came. To, he brought peace and he proclaimed peace. Commentators cannot agree on what it means that Christ came to preach peace. Does it mean Jesus' earthly ministry of preaching? Is it the crucifixion as a symbol of proclaiming peace? Is it the resurrection and how that proclaimed peace? Is it the preaching ministry of the apostles and now the church? I think, in my mind, why not all the above? Tony Meredith says this well, Jesus certainly proclaimed the gospel of peace before the cross, on the cross, and after the resurrection. And his proclamation were those who were far off, where many, but not all of the Gentiles, they knew nothing of Christ until after his ascension, and those who were near, the Jewish people that were waiting and anticipating a promised Messiah. And this proclamation of peace brought two groups of people removed their hostility towards one another because of their union with Christ. Our peace with God affects our relationships with other believers. It brings people together that the world says they do not belong. It crosses cultures, generations, social economic status because the blood of Christ is what bonds Christians together. In Christ's coming is truly peace on earth, but specifically between believers who the world have a hard time understanding what they would even have in common. I think for us, you might think to yourself, how do we even see this in our church? And if you look around, you might think we're a monolith. But in fact, I think if we look deeper, we might see that we are much more diverse than we realize. I'll give you an example. And specifically, and especially, if you look in our Chinese congregation, our brothers and sisters in the Chinese congregation, you maybe if you grew up and you kind of look over there, you realize they're all Chinese people. They all speak Mandarin. What's the big deal? How are they diverse? How do they show this unity in any way? But if you understood where a lot of them grew up, there you might find that a lot of dividing walls of hostility were broken. We are brothers and sisters that grew up and came from Taiwan. 
And in Taiwan, with a certain culture and certain practice, we have brothers and sisters that might have been raised and grew up in Hong Kong, which is a very different culture and practice. And then we have brothers and sisters that come from mainland China itself with a very different culture and practice. And if you studied any type of history from like 1940 <laughs> to now, you might realize, and just watching that, there's a lot of hostility between Taiwan and China, between Hong Kong and China, the 97 kind of giving back, and there's a lot of political differences. A lot of political differences. And if you've ever maybe even heard some of your parents talk, you might have even heard some of that before. How some might see the other in whatever way possible. But here, when I go and look, I was like, that is amazing to see believers from all different countries and all different places with different political backgrounds and how they were raised, they come to worship one God. And there's also a lot of things that you might, like for us, maybe as if you were born in America or you're many generations removed or maybe you're just not even Chinese at all, like we have never worried, like what kind of translation should we use? Or, or, or what kind of character should we use? And there's things like, should we use traditional or simplified? And there's all these things that are happening in our midst that we might not even realize that they have to come, they come together. And Christ broke a lot of these dividing walls of hostility so they can worship God together. And that is where I saw, my, that is actually really beautiful because that crosses a lot of political divide, cultural divide, a lot of animosity that they have might have grown up with. And we see this time and time again, even in Scripture. We see how the Jewish people learn how to accept and call their Gentile as their brother. We see how someone like Paul, who hated Christians, who kind of gave his life to killing Christians, all of a sudden became saved in Acts chapter 9. Have you ever wondered if you read that? Like maybe you grew up in church reading and knowing about that road to Damascus. How Paul was going to Damascus to go kill Christians, get blinded, and then he gets healed by Ananias and all of a sudden starts proclaiming Christ. And you might think to yourself, cool story. That's cool. Like, you know, you learn it. Like, that's, that's wonderful for Paul. But have you ever really thought the guy was their enemy? He was enemy of Christians. He comes. And if you ever read in Acts 9, the Lord approaches Ananias and tells him that you need to go heal Paul or Saul, his Hebrew name. And Ananias, and can anyone blame him? Pretty much like, God, are you sure you want, us to you want me to heal the guy that's trying to kill me? And he does that. And his conversion was so crazy that it confused everyone, Christians and non-Christians. Because the Christians are like, are you one of us? And the, the Jewish people are like, aren't you supposed to be killing them? And it confused everyone. Yet here we see those dividing walls of hostility accepting Paul in his midst, their enemy. It talks about scripture time and time again. Enemies coming together, becoming family in Christ. Whether we, what, uh, when we see in scripture or what we even see right now in different cultures, the peace of God bring peace and kinship to those who are enemies. What does that mean for us today then? What does that mean for us? Maybe, very realistically, you are in conflict with another believer right now. Or maybe you hold some prejudices against certain people, and it's hard for you to see that other person as a believer. And perhaps you just need to reconcile that today because in Christ, trusting that this is what the gospel is calling you to do, and how the gospel is calling you to go and reconcile certain relationships. Or maybe confess certain prejudices because we're reminded that Christ has broke those uh, walls of hostility. But at the same time, I think it's good for us to consider this as well. 
if the peace of God has brought enemies together, then what does it say about people we just don't know as well? You might not think to yourself at this moment, I don't have enemies. I don't really see people as enemies. And you might be right. You might not really have an enemy. But what does it mean for Christ to bring peace to people who don't have much, who do not have a lot of commonalities? What does it mean? How does he bring those people together? You might not share the same hobbies or interests. How does the peace of God affect your relationships with all types of believers? Not necessarily the ones that you're at odds with, but what about the ones you're just unfamiliar with? What does it say for the lonely believer we're called to reach out to? Or what does this say to the believer in our midst that maybe you just have a little bit difficult time having a conversation with them because you don't know what else to talk about? How does this impact those who might, not, who might just need a little bit more of our patience to interact with them? How does the culture of this church reflect the type of love, sincerity, and kinship with those we have nothing in common with except Jesus? What if, like, or who cares if they are not the same age as you or the same generation or grew up in the same place or maybe it's not even the same language you grew up speaking? And what if what if Christ is more than enough to be our highest bond and greatest commonality we can have? What if Christ came to bring peace to people not that hate each other, but really have nothing in common with each other? See, this Advent season, we are reminded that the coming of Christ was able to bring real peace to a people who desperately needed peace. Christ came to be our peace, to be our mediator between us and God, being brought into this kingdom. This is why we celebrate. This is why we worship. But with that kingdom citizenship and peace also draws us to others who are redeemed by Christ as well, forming a new kind of community and a new type of people. Let us not just only soak in that truth. Let us not only be comforted by that truth. Let us also live in that reality today. That he is the advent coming, arrival of our peace between us and him, but also between us and his people. That, that, beloved, it's beautiful and amazing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with thankfulness and gratefulness that you didn't just come to restore relationships between us and you, but you, get to re- you have restored our relationships with each other. The enemies have become family that strangers become friends. And Lord, I pray that we continue to learn to live that truth out in our church for your glory and for our good. May we reflect a diversity and a unity that shows the beauty of the gospel. We call this your son's name. Amen. This morning, we have an opportunity to celebrate some of that as well the unity we have in Christ and the peace that he's brought us together, we get an opportunity to install some new elders at our church. Now, the elders we have are um, that we have already introduced earlier. And so with that, we have our senior pastor to come. And I'd just like to hand this time off to our senior pastor for a time for this elder installation. I hear some rush for the water here. Uh, 
Uh, may I have somebody move this table away? <clears throat> Thank you. OK, uh, this now is time for the uh, installation service. Uh, I would like to invite the uh, three elders confirmed to come to the front with their better halves, standing to face the congregation, please. The voice of the Lord pierced the darkness of Israel's night, calling, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, for your servant hears. The voice of the Lord said to Isaiah, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah replied, Here I am, send me. The voice of the Lord came to brother Benjamin saying, look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see that the fields are wide for harvest. Will you teach the harvesters the things that you have heard from me? Benjamin. The voice of the Lord came to Brother GQ, saying, look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see that the fields are wide for harvest. Will Will you teach the harvesters the things you have heard from me? The voice of the Lord came to Brother Peter, saying, Look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see that the fields are wide for harvest. Will you teach the harvesters the things you have heard from me? Okay, now these are the vows. Brother Benjamin, to show that you promise to fulfill the tax of this office of elder, you are requested in the presence of God and his church to answer the following questions. First, do you believe that the call of this congregation, God alone calls you to this holy office? Second, do you believe the Old and the New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life, and do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teachings that contradict them? Sir, do you promise to do the work of your office faithfully, in a way worthy of your calling and submission to the government and discipline of the church? Benjamin. I do believe and promise. The Lord helped me through the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Brother GQ, to show that you promise to fulfill the tax of this office of elder, you are requested in the presence of God and his church to answer the following questions. First, do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God alone calls you to this holy office? Second, do you believe that the Old and New Testament are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life, and do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teachings that contradict them? Sir, do you promise to do the work of your office faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and submission to the government and discipline of the church? Brother Peter, to show that you promise to fulfill the tax of the office of elder, you are requested in the presence of God and his church to answer the following questions. Do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God alone calls you to this holy office? Second, do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life, and do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church rejecting all teachings that contradict them. Sir, yeah, yeah, <laughs> wait. Uh, do you promise to do the work of your 
office faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and submission to the government and discipline of the church. Now your turn. I do believe and promise the Lord helps me through the power and the grace of his Holy Spirit. Thank you. People of God, you have heard the commitments made by the three elders confirmed. Now, elders, by God's grace, let's install them in the name of Christ. Now I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Dennis, uh, Pastor Seal, uh, Elder Andrew. Please come to round. I would like the three elders and their better halves kneel in front of the congregation, then we'll pray for you. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you've called these qualified men to serve this church in a very special and specific way. Lord, we pray for their families, that they will continue to um, support uh, these men as they work for, um, you know, to honor you and glorify you. I pray they will learn to love you and follow you uh, just the way that their, um, these men do as well. We pray that you grant them wisdom and discernment in what they do, humility and, um, and holiness, Lord, in all that. Uh, they endeavor in. I pray, Lord, that the church will learn to continue to support these men. We learn to faithfully trust and follow um, follow them as our leaders. And Lord, I pray that you be honored and glorified in all that we do here at this church. We thank you so much for blessing us um, with this opportunity. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, now our brothers are called by God through your voice to the office of the elder. On behalf of the pastor, elder, and deacon board of CFD Berkeley Church, I present to you the three elders of the church, Elder Benjamin, Elder JQ, and Elder Peter. Thank you. Pastor Dennis. Uh, yeah, you okay. Oh, Amen. Um, what a blessing it is to have qualified men serve as our under-shepherds to bless and be ministers for our joy. Um, Vinewood, uh, having received God's welcome, forgiveness, peace, instruction, and communion, we respond by continuing our worship in returning a portion of what we've been given um, to the Lord. As Christians, we are called to give of our finances regularly, sacrificially, and joyfully to support the work of the local church in our ministries. And you can give through PayPal or Zelle. Please go to our website, vinewoodcfc.com, for further details, uh, and you can click on the Give tab. If you are new to Vinewood, um, please do not feel obligated to give and contribute to the local ministry, um, but we would love to get connected to you. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to fill out the welcome card that should be in the chair in front of you. Uh, you can scan the QR code and do it online as well, uh, or you can return the physical welcome card to <clears throat> any of our ushers who should be wearing the nice purple lanyards. Um, and as we close our time together, uh, I do have a few announcements to highlight. Please bear with me. I think we have a little bit more this week. Uh, first is prayer meeting. Uh, it takes place at 8.40 a.m. on Sundays, uh, up there to my left. Uh, there is a Zoom link available, but please, if you are able, uh, we encourage you to come join us in person. Uh, next, CFC will be holding a Christmas Eve service um, uh, on December 24th at 5 p.m. right here. 
This is a combined service with our Chinese congregation that will be held in addition to the regular Vinewood Sunday service. So we do hope to see you there. Uh, next, our Spring Evangelism class series, Fishers of Men, will begin on January 21st at 11 a.m. Uh, it's seven classes. Uh, the class details and full schedule will be posted on the website. You can also contact uh, Ben or Nick. Um, next, we are also excited to kick off a Bible study basics class in the spring. So the first class will also be January, 20, or January 21st, 11 o'clock on Sundays. Um, so this will run concurrently with the evangelism class. Uh, through it, we will learn some principles of biblical interpretation and do some practice as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Pastor Theo or myself. Um, and next, to support and encourage our sisters as they start our women's ministry, we will be holding an LSF Women's Conference on January 26th and 27th. So if you are post-grad, feel free to sign up on that uh, scan. Um, and if I may borrow another minute uh, to share a praise, uh, we, um, some of you may have known, we had a little bit of trouble trying to find a speaker, so I asked some of our congregants and also our leadership to pray, and lo and behold, now we have two. So I am super excited. Um, I think they'll, they'll be really great, and uh, please do RSVP. I think it'll be a wonderful time. Um, and lastly, there's no graphic for this, but if you do wish to receive your 2023 offering receipt by email, please send your request to cfcaccounting at gmail.com with your name and address. If you want to receive your receipt by regular mail, please ensure your current mailing address is on the check. Uh, find this announcement also on our website, and you can find the rest of our announcements on the website as well. Now, Pastor Dennis. Please stand for a benediction. Please bow. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping alongside with us. For the students, I wish you a very good luck for your exams. For everyone else, have a very wonderful non-exam time. <laughs> See you next week. Love you. Bye.